remakes. In the past 10 to 15 years, the concept of remakes has really become despised. It's interesting because there was a time where, while well, people might still get a little edgy, they were a little more open and willing to give a chance to a remake of an older film. And one of the particular genres that get a lot of remakes that people are very edgy about is horror. And some people forget that a few of the best horror films actually are themselves remakes or and I don't really like using this word that often, reboots. Good examples could be the Christopher Lee Dracula movies, David Cronenberg's The Fly, and as I reviewed it uh, about a month ago, John Carpenter's The Thing. The original films they were based on were pretty good, but the remakes were just superior in so many ways and have become the films that people think of as the all-time classics. And next to remaking films that were already pretty well liked, there also were remakes of films that were virtually excellent or perfect in their first go, and yet the remake was able to be pretty decent. A good example of this is today's review of the 1990 remake of Night of the Living Dead. Everybody would probably think, why remake Night of the Living Dead, the film that shaped the way we still look at movie zombies today? Apparently, George A. Romero heard that Menahem Golan, the second half of the Israeli cousin producer team Golan Globus, was interested in remaking Night of the Living Dead with his new film company, 21st Century Film Corporation. Wonder how 20th Century Fox felt when they heard that title. After going through the usual talk of how they were going to do this, Romero reteamed with, for the first time in over two decades, John A. Russo, the original co writer of the 1968 Night of the Living Dead, and Russell Steiner, one of the original producers in that film. And Russo and Steiner came together to produce this remake, while Romero and this is pretty unique, because you rarely would see the original creator do this. George A. Romero wrote the script for the remake of his own original classic. And, uh, I feel really good about this. Yeah. yeah. I have a really positive attitude. And then he was able to get his friend and makeup artist of his most acclaimed films, Tom Savini, to take the directing chair. Before the 1990 Night of the Living Dead, Tom Savini had worked pretty exclusively in makeup and special effects and occasionally acting. His only directing credits before this had been for the TV show that George A. Romero produced in the 80s, Tales from the Dark Side. And for a first time director, I think this film came out looking just... Excellent. The pacing, the setup of shots, just the way the house, the fields in this movie are filmed, the actress performances, it's near fucking perfect. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Stop it! You're ignorant! They're coming to get you, Barbara. Something that I find very interesting when watching the 1990 Night of the Living Dead is just how closely it follows the story of the original film, like the series of events that take place from Barbara and her brother Johnny at the cemetery, to arriving at the house and Barbara meeting Ben, to the reveal of the Cooper family and Tom and Judy. And when you see just how similar it is to the original, you think, this movie really should not have worked, because we've seen a lot of remakes that are just kind of rehashes of the original film, where they just changed a few little things. But what makes this one different is the heart that was put into it. You can tell, everybody who made this film, and I know it has George A. Romero coming back as the screenwriter, but you can tell that everybody who worked on this film made it out of complete respect to the original, and it's clear, they were remaking it not to improve on the original, but as a tribute almost, and to implement a few ideas that they wanted to try on the original, but couldn't do. This film had a budget of a little over four million dollars, and they used every cent of it well. Sadly, the film wasn't a huge financial hit, but 
It's developed a strong cult following and garnered a lot more respect over the years. You leave that door open. We may want to get down there. We may need to get down there if those things break in. Yeah, sure. You want the best of both worlds. You want to get in that cellar, you get in there now or you can forget it. Not boxing myself in down there. A huge thing that really makes this remake work is the cast. We can get away. No, it's too dangerous. You know I'm right. The character of Barbara is given a huge change from the original film. In the original film, she encounters the zombie and sees her brother killed, and for most of the film, she stays in a catatonic state, just traumatized by everything she's seen. And the reason George A. Romero, who usually liked having strong female characters in his films, went with this particular portrayal of Barbara was because of Judith O'Dea's performance or the, what she offered to give to the character and seeing how strong she was in that performance, that's what they went with. And it worked in that film. But in this film, we get a much stronger, kick-ass Barbara, played by Patricia Tallman, who doesn't have a strong acting filmography. Her biggest role I could find has been in Babylon 5, but she actually has a stronger career as a stunt woman. Her most notable work being Laura Dern's stunt double in Jurassic Park. And I think it's a shame she doesn't have more acting cred to her name because, my god, she is fantastic in this role. She plays a very three-dimensional character who goes through all the realistic stages that somebody in such a horrible epidemic would go through. At the beginning of the film, we see Barbara with her brother Johnny, played in pretty much a cameo by Bill Mosley, post-Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, pre-House of a Thousand Corpses. It's too late now. There's no escape. No, mother! It's a pretty funny little role. Oh, Johnny! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hey. Hey, man, are you okay? And after doing a slight reenactment of the original version's opening scene, but adding a little twist. It's weird, huh? Johnny gets killed. And Barbara, the things that happen to her in this opening scene are pretty cool. They show like a bit of realism to it. Like she gets in the car, sees there's no keys, the zombies break in, and she can't really get away, like go down the road. But to get away from them just briefly in the moment, pulls off the emergency brake, and unlike the original where the car drives down the hill, this one just rolls backwards, crashing. This is actually Tom Savini's own car. It was the first car he ever bought when he became successful. And I don't know why he picked that particular car, but he said it broke his heart to smash it. Oh well. After that, Barbara makes her way to the house that the majority of the film will take place in. Right away, she is confronted by multiple zombies. Patricia Tallman just comes off so amazingly well during these first few minutes. And then, this is when Ben shows up. And the character of Ben from the original, played by Dwayne Jones, was groundbreaking. Made at a time where a movie with a black lead would not be welcome in certain areas. And Dwayne played the role with complete authority and class. Just plowed right through them. They didn't move, they didn't run, or... Just stood there, staring at me. Just wanted to crush them. So, you think, who could play the role again and give an equally great performance? How about the Candyman himself, Tony Todd? Any 
anyone else inside? Two years before he would become a horror icon of the 1990s, Tony Todd stars in his first leading role. Taking on the role of such an iconic horror protagonist is no easy feat. And Tony Todd, being a badass, is in his blood, so he takes charge of the character, and he and Patricia Tallman, together, they fight the zombies, they work together. One of my favorite parts of this remake is the chemistry and rapport between Ben and Barbara. Just seeing them work together and get to know each other in the first uh, 20 minutes. Look, I don't know what's going on, but I sure as hell know that it ain't no prison break. It ain't no kind of chemical that I ever heard about can make a dead man walk. This is something that nobody has ever heard about and nobody's ever seen before. After going through the shock part of seeing the zombies and having time to think, Barbara gets herself together and works with Ben to get the house secure. And when the other characters suddenly appear, she's there to make sure everybody has their head on straight and... And in what could be the best scene in the film, she calls out the other characters when they're fighting. You are losing it, girl. You are losing it! You think so? Whatever I lost, I lost a long time ago, and I do not plan on losing anything else. You can talk to me about losing it when you stop screaming at each other like a bunch of two-year-olds. And despite being the badass heroes of this movie, Patricia Tallman and Tony Todd still are allowed a few scenes to show some vulnerability to their characters. Ben being that while he can kill the zombies, it just uh, breaks him inside to do it. Barbara. Later in the film, we get this great scene where she is walking through a field just out of reach of the zombies and has a brief crying moment where you totally feel for her and just understand what she's going through. For the past couple of years, I've been watching people on YouTube do review shows where they give their thoughts as well as do a lot of comedy. People like the Nostalgia Critic, the Cinema Snob, the Blockbuster Buster, and... so many fucking others. And like all these other movie reviewers, I've given myself a review nickname. It's something that I think will grab people's attention. will let you know immediately that I'm a movie guy. And it's a name I'm sure that no one else has thought of using. The Unusual Suspect. I don't want to sound too full of myself, but it just feels so great when you come up with something so original. Um, babe, I think that there is something you should see. The other actors in the cast include William Butler as Tom and Katie Freeman as Judy. It's alright, don't shoot, don't shoot, mister! It's just us! Who the hell is us? Tom Bain or 
Sure, sir, that's me. This here's Judy Rose. The Tom and Judy characters, while I thought they were pretty well done in the 1968 version, they were admittedly, um, the weakest characters in the original film, but here, they're given a lot more, uh, personality. Uncle Reed, he went after my cousin Satchel, you know? He, he went after him like, uh... I'm coming with you! I can drive! No, Judy Rose, you're staying here! No, somebody's gotta drive, somebody's gotta do the gas, and somebody's gotta ride shotgun! That means three of us goes out! I think William Butler as Tom, behind Ben and Barbara, is my favorite character in the remake. No good. It's better than nothing, Ben. No good. Find some kind of stupid. What? Them old doors. The ones we've took down, they're all in the cellar. The best way to describe the character is he's a little dumb, but he can pick up pretty quickly on things as long as there's someone to tell him what to do, and he's got a heart of gold. There's just a cute, uh, kind of southern charm to him. I mean, Uncle Reach coming after him and all, you know. I run down here and got the shotgun, but what could I do? You know, I couldn't imagine shooting Uncle Reach. And Katie Freeman, who's a Tony Award winning actress, she does well as Judy, as long as the filmmaker's intent was to make Judy just a insufferable cunt. <laughs> Understandably, the character is scared, but goddamn, is she fucking stupid. You saw Mr. Lucrata! Look at his back! You saw him! Look at his back! I didn't do that! Look there! Even Tom was able to figure out that the dead are coming back to life. She actually is stupid enough to say to everybody when they're fighting, I'm running on you for shit, Cooper! That's why I'm not gonna let You're you- You're gonna keep on fighting! Really? With everything going on, you're actually thinking this is a case of, if you don't behave, we'll throw you out of our house. Just... This is our house! This is Tommy's house! And if you want to play Brewster with it, I'd like to know where you'd all be if we didn't let you in here! Where would you be if we didn't you that? But as annoying as Judy can get, she is not as despicable or as cowardly as Harry Cooper, played by the late Tom Towles. Now, the Harry Cooper of the original Night of the Living Dead was an asshole, but he had a few brief human moments. And while he kind of becomes a villain at the end of that film, it wasn't, like, a continuous ongoing thing. There was a period where he worked with the group and he tried to help out. And while he was cowardly, when push came to shove, he did step in to help, if only briefly and, well, it might have been a little too late. This Harry Cooper is just awful. I mean, it's a well-acted performance. It's well-written. But he is a horrible human being. From the get-go, this version of Harry Cooper... Do you mind if we ask who the hell you are now? Girl's name is Barbara. I'm Ben. You damn near broke my arm here, Mr. Ben. We didn't see nothing home to hear. We didn't see nothing. Damn it! We have heard all this before! I didn't hear before, Cooper. He lets it, the fact that he doesn't like someone else being in charge be known right away, and... I'm not going down there until I know what all the options are. What damn options? And who the fuck gave you the right to decide for the rest of us? And like in the original, he wants to hide in the basement. I shut this door. I'm not opening it again until somebody comes who can get us out of here. You're gonna die. Cooper just won't listen to reason, and... He acts on edge, and even though we only see him drink a single beer in this film, his performance, the way he acts, it seems to be a combination of going crazy under the stress of what's happening, and also possibly being drunk. I've only been around you a minute or two, but that's enough time for me to know that I don't like you very much. I'm sure you feel the same about me, so let's just try to stay out of each other's way, all right? All he does is really whine and complain and... 
we're gonna stand around and bullshit, let's do it in the cellar where it's safe. Idiots! You lame brains! It's safer down here! We're going up. We've gotta get help for Sarah. I'm not opening that door, Helen, and neither are you, and if you try, so help me out. You yeah. what? And for anyone who thinks this might be bad or too one-dimensional, I feel it fits the character perfectly. He seems like a guy who hates following orders, he hates listening to ideas by other people, or people challenging his ideas. And why do I feel that's who this character is in general, like before the zombies started attacking? While in the basement with his wife, Helen, played by McKee Anderson, she has the sense to actually work with everybody, and when she tries to go up, he just hits her in the face, and as she sits there holding in a cry, we see him just smirking. So, yeah, this guy who appears to be a just abusive and controlling cunt, the attitude he has to, the, to Ben and the whole group, I think it makes sense that this character would be like this, because there are people like this who don't like taking direction or listening to anything that wasn't their own idea. And when Tom desperately needs Harry's help... The only moment in the film that comes close to a human moment is the scene where he sees his dead daughter as a zombie and they tell him to shoot it and he can't. The only way I'm going out there is with you and that rifle keeping things straight. Tom, let's go, it's you and me. And when Ben, Tom, and Judy try to escape, he tries to take the opportunity to steal a gun away from Barbara and... What the gun? Get it out, Cooper! Just crawl back in here! And like the original film, the attempted escape fails. These are the wrong damn keys! Except this film has the budget to make the failure as visually impressive as it is tragic. And the daughter, who was renamed from Karen to Sarah for the remake, after she kills her mother, in not such a chilling way as the original, but also featuring a minor tribute to that iconic death scene, after she gets up from the cellar and Ben tries to shoot her. Cooper runs up to the attic. Barbara feels it's time to run for it. She looks at Ben and he tells her He's been hit so bad he can't make it. I'm hurt bad. I find the scene where Barbara and Ben separate just to be heartbreaking. These two have been together throughout the whole film and they've formed a strong bond and just seeing them break apart it ripped me up inside. The scene of Ben hiding out in the cellar and sees the key that would have opened the lock on the gas pump, thereby preventing Tom and Judy's death, and just breaks down laughing, knowing, just accepting the hopelessness of it all, and the hopelessness in Tony Todd's eyes. It just, it hurts to look at. After getting away, Barbara comes across a posse of rednecks hunting zombies, and pretty quickly she becomes part of the hunting group. And showing once again that George A. Romero excelled at commentary, Barbara wakes up the next morning and sees that the hunting posse has kind of become a party almost. Barbara sees the rednecks all just 
fucking around with the zombies after a cameo from the original Johnny. Tell me, Gene, are these Put things over there? Yeah, they're Here's dead. One. They're all messed up. And probably the most iconic shot from this remake that is very chilling to look at. We see that the hunters have lynched them from a tree, and as they dangle, they use them for target practice. This was originally going to be in the original film, but due to the racial tensions at the time, it was decided not to include it. Them, they're us. The hunters make it to the house that Barbara was in the previous night, and going inside, she and the hunters find Ben. And while it's not as tragic as the ending of the original Night of the Living Dead, seeing Ben like this is almost as heartbreaking as the scene where he and Barbara split apart. Her look of seeing Ben as a zombie just... It's hard to describe, it just speaks volumes. And then, who should Barbara come across but... Came back. Followed by her doing what we all wanted to see happen so bad. It's unclear if they realized that Harry was alive, but Barbara giving the final line of the film, copying the original, but also adding a new badass twist to it, says... It's another one for the fire. And I've been questioning what she did. The rednecks just shrug and quickly move along, and... While they don't look afraid at all, I like to think that in their heads they're like, let's not ask questions. The film ends with the zombie carcasses being thrown onto a pile, and Barbara loading up her gun, looking just cool as hell, watches them go up in flames, and the look on Barbara's face as she reflects on the situation and everything that's happened is just both awesome cold and chilling all at the same time. Then the film plays out, paying one more tribute to the original movie by having a series of photographs play of the zombie burning. The last few things I just want to say before I get my final thoughts are Unlike the original film, which, while it did not give a definitive reason for why the zombies were coming back, did have a scene that said that... All the betting on the answer to that question centers on the recent Explorer satellite shot to Venus. That satellite, you'll recall, started back to Earth, but never got here. Then perp was purposely destroyed by NASA scientists discovered it was carrying a mysterious high-level radiation. Could that radiation be somehow responsible for the wholesale murders we're now suffering? In this movie, there is literally no reason whatsoever given for why the dead are coming back to life. And in a way, that is a little more chilling. Just leaves a bit of ambiguity, wondering if it's a science thing, a nature thing, or if there's some supernatural reason behind it. It was just a, that was a good little update for the remake, and... Now, for anyone who might be asking, do I think the 1990 remake of Night of the Living Dead is better than the original? No. But... I think it is just as excellent. The 1968, 1990 versions, the 1978 Dawn of the Dead, the 1985 Day of the Dead, all four of these films are just perfect zombie films, either directed by or co-created by George A. Romero, the father of the modern zombie. It's hard to believe it's been over a year since he died, and all I can say is... 
George A. Romero, he may be gone, but his films, they will live on forever. They are classics. They are amazing. And if you love horror films, independent films, I recommend checking them out. And this remake of one of the greatest horror films ever made is totally worthy of your time, and it couldn't be any more perfect. I give it a 9.7 out of 10, baby. This is hell on earth. This is pure hell on earth.